Hey Tommy, today's podcast slash video is a good one because we're talking about the things that you guys certainly love to talk about and that is the least and most reliable car brands out there. Very cool stuff, that's right. So this is the Consumer Reports annual top brand reliability rankings report. But of course, you guys don't only buy brands, you buy cars. So in this video, we're gonna talk about individual models as well as some of the highlights on both the most reliable as well as the least reliable ends of the spectrum. Yeah, now Consumer Reports, of course, uh, does some very thorough testing. They're a non-for-profit uh, based out of the Northeast. Uh, and uh, they've been doing this for quite a while. So, you know, I, I have a lot of faith in their numbers. Uh, a lot of times when we do these things uh, based on some other companies that are out there, you guys will say to us, well, they're paid to do this. And Consumer Reports isn't paid to do this. They actually buy the cars themselves for the most part. Uh, they go to the dealer, they buy them, uh, and, and then uh, they call, I don't know, thousands of people uh, on their uh, non-for-profit uh, list of patrons, and that's how they compile these lists. Yeah, very cool stuff. So they're actually talking to owners out there and getting their impressions on the vehicles, how they've been in terms of reliability and longevity. And, and I would suggest you go to Consumer Reports if you want to do a deep dive on this, but we're going to hit the highlights. So Tommy, do you want to do the least or most reliable brands first? We're going to start with the most reliable brands okay. and the reliability rating is out of 100 possible points. Now let's hit some highlights. Mazda is second overall, but the Mazda 3 has just above average reliability. Okay, and how about the Miata? The Mi MX-5 Miata helped the brand's average to stay near the top spot, so it looks like the Miata is exceptionally reliable in the Mazda brand. Um, Buick is the most reliable domestic brand, which is interesting. Yeah, I would have never guessed that. And the new Envision is the big winner in this category. It took the luxury compact SUV class as a whole. The Enclave, though, has reliability concerns and falls to below average. So it's cool seeing these lists because you can not only see the brands, but the individual um, metrics for the different models as well. Now you couldn't of course talk about reliability without talking about Toyota, right? Yeah, so some Toyota models dropped in reliability. So the Corolla hatchback, the RAV4, the Sienna, and Tacoma were average. The RAV4 Prime and the Venza fared well though. Okay, but not all brands are represented here, Tommy. That's right, so Consumer Reports didn't rate some brands because of insufficient data or the brand makes too few models. So we're discussing um, Alfa Romeo, Fiat, Polestar, Maserati, and a few other examples in this list. Actually, and, we're not discussing them. Well, we're not discussing them, that's true. <laughs> and some of the brands that fell in the middle include Chrysler, Porsche, Chevrolet, and Ford. Yeah, uh, and then um, the top-ranking American cars outside the Buick Envision include the, well, look at this, Chevy Trailblazer. The Chevy Silverado and GMC Sierra 2500. The Chrysler 300, uh, the new Bronco uh, Sport, uh, and the Mustang Mach-E and the Ranger. So what we mean here when we talk about brands that fall in the middle, we're going to discuss the top 10 most reliable brands and then the other end of the spectrum too, the least most reliable brands. But of course there are brands that fall in the middle that are kind of average. So why don't we go down the list, Ed, of the most reliable brands starting with number 10. All right. Well, that's a surprise. Yeah, number 10 is a major <laughs> surprise. Yeah, because you're, you're, we're big fans of this brand. Uh, and actually, uh, it, in the outside world, uh, and I'm talking about the street cred, uh, this brand does not have a good reputation, I would say, in general. And unfortunately, or fortunately for them, unfortunately for the people who like to like to diss this brand, but fortunately for the brand, it's what, Tommy? Well, number 10 is Mini. So they scored a reliability rating of 60 out of 100. But the biggest surprise is that compared to 2020, they are up 13 positions. So they've done a huge jump over the last year in improving the brand reliability, coming in at the number 10 most reliable brand. Now, I would actually uh, echo that. You know, we just bought the Mini SE, uh, and we've owned now, uh, what, four Minis, Tommy? Oh, gosh, we own the SE, the GP, uh, the Classic Mini, and what's which one's the one you just purchased? A 2003. And a 2003. Uh, and you can really tell uh, in terms of kind of fit and finish just how much better uh, the vehicles have gotten over those years, right? Because the initial um, years that BMW purchased Mini, uh, the, the vehicles well, it felt like they weren't screwed together all that well. We actually had a convertible that after like 20,000 miles was starting to get a little rattly. Uh, but this new SE that we have is rock solid. Okay, we've only put, what, 4,000 miles on it, but so far everything seems to be, you know, really well uh, screwed together. Uh, we've had zero issues with it. Zero. Uh, everything works. Uh, it's tight. Uh, it feels, dare I say it, Mercedes-like. Well, let's not get too carried away here. 
But like you mentioned, Ed, the the minis when they first came to the states, um, in in well, okay, they came they came here in like the middle of the 20th century. But when they made their big return in 2002, they did have a lot of problems, and they quickly gained a reputation for being expensive to run and hard to fix. And that we saw that throughout the early 2000s in the first generation into the second generation that had the big timing chain issues. But the latest generation, which came out in like 2014, especially the hardtop, have really proven to be like a step above where they were um, 10, 15 years ago. And they really have come through in a big way in terms of upping their quality. So it's cool to see that even within la in the last year, they are up 13 spots. Yeah, and so in this podcast, we thought it'd be fun and video uh, to kind of, you know, go down the list and then talk about our anecdotal uh, evidence that we've actually experienced because we've driven all these vehicles. We've, of course, reviewed all of them uh, in the last 10 years. So we can kind of get a sense for what the brand is doing and what we feel is you know, working and what isn't working. Uh, uh, just to echo what you said, Tommy, the first gen mini CVT had a 100% failure rate. I mean, that's pretty... Yeah, pretty pr bad. Pretty bad. Uh, uh, and then... Um, the other issue with uh, the, the original minis, and I think it's an issue just in mini in general, is uh, packaging is so tight, it's hard to get at things, and that makes them hard to repair. Uh, and that, of course, increases the cost of ownership. Uh, and, and sometimes I feel like while you're buying a mini because it's you know owned by BMW, you're kind of paying BMW prices when you go out and actually service the thing or have it uh, you know uh, fixed in any kind of way because it, it is now very, um, well, very German. So number nine on the list of the most reliable car brands, Nissan. Now this is up four positions from 2020 with a reliability rating of 63 out of 100. Uh, Nissan, you know, Nissan has been uh, a brand that, that has uh, had kind of a tumultuous last maybe 10 years under Carlos Ghosn, the, 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 you know, the most... Uh, not the recent, but the, 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 well, should we say storied CEO? I think what, what the consensus in the industry is that what he did was he kind of basically took a lot of money out of the company uh, and so uh, made it profitable short term, but did so by selling off the long term reliability of the brand and of its new product line. And the lifeblood of any car company is new product, and Nissan hasn't had any. Uh, and it's good to see him kind of start to get their mojo back. Uh, and so the most recent vehicles that we've tested from them, uh, be it the new Frontier, which we actually have parked in front of our offices right now, uh, or the new Pathfinder, or the new Rogue, uh, feel like they're uh, they're you know they're a notch above what was being produced before. And for a long time, let's face it, Nissan had the least expensive car in America, and that's kind of a dubious. And I'm talking about the Versa, not the Versa Note. That's kind of a dubious distinction. Yeah. And going forward, they've got some other cool products in the pipeline that are more enthusiast-driven, like the, the new Z looks truly phenomenal, so very excited to see what that's like to drive. I do think that they are kind of dragging themselves out of um, the depths of cost-cutting and out of the depths of the ultimate Uber car, let's be brutally honest with that, because, like you mentioned, there was kind of the dark air there in the, the late 2000s, early 2010s, where it felt like their cars were pretty cheaply assembled, even from the driving experience, and then they had the CBT issues. But now that we're entering the, the 2020s, the new vehicles are really coming out of the, the gates kicking strong. So like you talked about the Pathfinder, fully redesigned, it's got the new nine speed automatic transmission, feels great. I think I think going away from the CVT has helped too. Um, you know, their CVT has been ubiquitous in everything and it has not been, at least according to, you know, the, the comments that we're reading uh, and your, your input has not been the most reliable. It also depends on the maker of the CVT and the generation. So some of the older stuff was much worse than the newer stuff. But the new road, I think the new Rogue still uses the continuously variable, but it's an amazing car. They co-developed it with Mitsubishi and the Outlander. Really is a, a great vehicle, so that, that's a cool one um, if you're looking for just kind of a, a good runabout for the family. Uh, before it was just the only reason to buy a Rogue was it was cheap, but now the, there's, there's actually compelling reasons and interior quality to buy a Rogue. So very cool stuff coming out of Nissan. They are up four on the list. That brings us to number eight. Acura with a reliability rating of 64 out of a possible 100 points. Yeah, it's new on the list, huh? It is new on the list. Acura, of course, is the luxury division of Honda, Japanese manufacturer, so you might expect them to be on the list, and they come in at number eight in the most reliable car brands. You know, I've always felt Acura has been uh, relatively reliable. Uh, I've never felt like this has been an issue for them. Uh, they've had other issues, <laughs> like naming cars, but this is not a show about, <laughs> you know, whether it should be called the TSX or the <laughs> Endeavor, <laughs> you know, something more interesting. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's good to see Acura on the list, uh, and uh, I think, you know, Acura should be on the list. I would, I would 
I, I guess I equate luxury brands with reliability, even though I guess that doesn't necessarily correlate. Does that make sense? Well, as in we my look, brain, that, as, that's how it's wired. But as we look at the least reliable list, we will in fact find out that luxury brands do not equal reliability. I know, but that's it's weird because I guess because I figure you pay more for them, they should be more reliable. But that doesn't necessarily follow. But that's how I got it wired in my brain. I have um. So we've got this puppy Blaze, who's a Bernese Mountain Dog, yep. and he goes to this groomer um, like once every three months. And I, I talk to this guy, and he watches the channel sometimes, and he's he's a car guy, and he is a diehard Acura fan, but like an early 2000s, late 90s diehard Acura fan. What's what's the one he's got parked in front of his office? He has two or three legends. He's got three legends. Yep. My, my. And he drove his first legend to 500,000 miles before it started burning too much oil. And his second legend is at like 180. Wow. And he just swears by him. He, uh, he is dedicated to naturally aspiration and um, big old sedan. So he was talking to me actually about the Genesis and the Equus. Models uh, with the the V8. Yeah, I have to say when both uh, you know uh, Lexus and Acura came out at the same time. This was before your time. Uh, like the Legend, the Integra, uh, the original NSX. Right. These 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 vehicles. I think they put their best foot forward, uh, and they did a really good job with them. Uh, and they weren't just. Um, I mean, maybe because they were new brands, uh, they spent a little bit more engineering love on them, right? So they felt like they were more than just, you know, a, 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 a luxury version of an Acura, of a, of a Honda, if you see what I'm saying. Yes, that's true. Although there was a lot of kind of, um, I don't want to say badge engineering, but but platform sharing. Oh, yeah, for sure. Like, I think an Integra has always just been a version of a Civic, right? Yes. An Integra has always been like an SI Civic in yeah. some ways or another. So, uh, but I do agree that there was a ton of really amazing engineering going on in the early 2000s, especially for longevity. Whether or not we'll see 500,000 miles out of a TSX today, uh, time will tell. But certainly the legend, I've got anecdotal proof, is <laughs> quite a reliable vehicle. Okay, uh, number seven on our list, Tommy, is what? Subaru. So Subaru. they came in with a 66 out of 100 on the rating scale, up one spot from their position in 2020. Yeah, um, good for them. Yep, good for them. All right, number six on the list is Honda. Not too much experience with Subaru. Uh, Honda comes in at 66 out of 100 as well. They are actually down one from last year. What do you think about Honda falling one slot? I think Honda has always been, you know, a very solid brand. Well, keep in mind they're still six out of the whole list. They're, yeah, they're yeah, doing yeah, pretty well. Yeah, yeah, they're you know they're engineering driven brand, right? And when you have a brand that's based on on solid engineering, right, then uh, reliability does tend to be the kind of the flip side of that coin. Um, I think you know. <laughs> Hondas are great, uh, and they're not. Some, it feels like sometimes some of the brands are engineered to like start falling apart after like the first hundred thousand miles. I, I think Hondas tend to exceed that. But you were just doing some work on your grandma's car, which is a Honda Fit, the first gen. Yes, How's my, that holding up? My grandma, believe it or not, I yeah. I, I, I was giving it heck because they had to go through the fender liner to get to a, a light bulb this weekend. In the headlight, which is a pain. You, in the you butt. couldn't go through the hood. No, you had to go underneath. You but, click your computer. Sorry. Oh, yep. Picture hey, picture yeah. fell asleep, but the that little Honda Fit, it's a 2008. Um, it lives, it's lived its entire life about 25 feet from the ocean in Florida, which is not a great place to live your entire life because there's a lot of salt in the air. Yes, in enormous amounts of humidity. Yes, and this little car is just, it just runs and runs and runs and runs, and it drives super well. Um, I actually prefer driving it to most rental cars when I go see her just because it's super fun to drive. It's got paddle shifters in it. Um, it's been beautifully reliable. She's up to 77,000 miles, uh, all of which were on top of curbs. So very, very, very long-lived which, car. Which is interesting because, look, some brands skew older, like the next brand certainly skews older, and so does Honda. Do you think that affects reliability? Like who's driving it? Like yeah, gram that could. Grandma versus, like, you know, somebody your age who's who's out there <laughs> <laughs> tearing it up. In my grandma's case, I think that would skew her reliability downwards. She's also tearing it up just in a different way. Yeah, exactly. She's a horrible driver. <laughs> but yeah, I love this little Honda Fit. Now that of course is a late 2000s Honda and the brand has changed a lot since then. Um, some of the new stuff I'm not as excited about actually. I feel like they've kind of lost the, the plot on some of the new cars. Like the new Accord is not as fun as some of the older Accords, the manual transmissions. and The new SI I liked a lot, but I do really miss the old NA VTEC era of SIs. Um, and then the SUVs are pretty good, like the Passport and the, the Pilot I do like a lot. Yeah, and there's always that, uh, and, and this is not true, but there's always that temptation to be like, in the good old days, right? And, and uh, you know, I, I've been listening to a lot of podcasts, and I've been listening to reruns of uh, uh, Click and Clack, the Tappan Brothers, you uh -huh. know, Car Talk. Um, and uh, it just, uh, 
uh, they, they always made this point where people would be calling in. They'd be like, oh, back in the 70s, we had this great Dodge Dart. And they, they were right. They were like, cars back in the day were incredibly unsafe. Right. They had things like points where the humidity would affect whether the thing would actually start or not. Sure. And, and you know, you run our Classics channel. Uh, we just went and purchased a classic uh, Porsche 944 Turbo. Uh, what do you think of, like, the 1980s engineering of those vehicles? Well, it's pretty brilliant, isn't it? <laughs> Except when the headlights don't go up. But yeah, we, we spent this, we spent Sunday fixing the or replacing the motor on that. On the headlight motor. But I think, look, it... I do agree that people look back with rose-colored glasses to the 1960s and their Ford Mustang right, and yeah, well, Kudas. V8 and... But I also think it's, and I think a lot of that was false because those cars had panel gaps that you could slide the state of Nebraska through. But um, if you look at like Hondas from the late 90s, early 2000s, I do believe that those are some of the best and longest lived cars in history. They just go forever. Um, and that was before the eras of a lot of turbocharging in the Honda cars. So I do hope that the new ones are as good as the old ones. You still see like mid ninety Civics everywhere. No exhaust on them, rusted quarter panels. Yeah. And then, then you also have to kind of differentiate between like the metal in the vehicle and the engineering and then the powertrain, right? Those are very different things. So like, you know, people, people think Toyotas are some of the most reliable cars, but when Toyota first came to America, they just had horrendous issues with their, their metal, right? It, the, 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 the trucks and the cars, and Honda, same thing. Uh, you know, we had uh, the first Honda Civic, the CVCC, and that rusted away into nothing in the first three years. Well, I would argue that They if, weren't galvanized, right? If you look at even Toyotas in the last 10 years, right? Toyota had that massive issue with the, the rust on the FJ Cruiser frames, the Tacoma frames, right? You had recalls for the entire frame of the truck. They had, a, they had, a, yeah, they had basically they had to do a, 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 a body off uh, frame swap on the Tacomas, which is incredible when you think about it. And monstrously expensive. So, yeah. certainly, I think that's a very wise thing you said, where you have to kind of separate reliability. And then same thing with like Toyota trucks will go forever, but you see a lot of them with no no bedsides on them because they just rot away. So moving on from Honda, number five on the list, 66 out of 100 points, is Buick. They are down one. Very interesting that Buick is in the top five most reliable car brands. Yeah, yeah considering most recently uh, their cars have been basically rebranded Opals. Yes. Yeah. Or, not, or, not a lot of excitement or, going on in that brand. Or a lot right of now. platform sharing, but maybe also when you don't have a lot of new vehicles coming through, then you have a lot of... Uh, you have a lot of reliability because you're not pushing the envelope. Well, I, I am ashamed to say this. Yeah. I'm not sure I could name the entire Buick lineup right now. I could, it would be hard. What's the little one? The Entourage? Enclave or is that? No, that's the big one. Okay. I think it's the Encore. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's all E's now. Um, and then the Elevator is next. <laughs> The, the egg? Sa the LeSabre? Is that still around? <laughs> no, they're all E's. The um, en Encore is a little one. Envision, I think. Enclave. I mean, we could Google it. Or Escalade? You guys could Google it. Is Escalade one of them? <laughs> but as an automotive journalist, I, I feel very bad having to Google the lineup. Yeah, yeah. I think Buick is uh, certainly... Um, they, they Apparently, they're building good cars and that I'm just stupid and don't know them. But, um, I have to say, Tommy, I do... I have a secret uh, desire, uh, guilty pleasure for owning a Cascada. Yes, uh, you do I, own I a Cascada. <laughs> but it's gone now. It's a, that's a rebranded Opal as well. The, I do like the rebranded Opal. The thing I funny think I funny is that, that those commercials were like, that's a Buick? <laughs> on all these people on the side of the street. That's kind of how I feel when I see a Buick. I'm like, is that a Buick? I don't know. Is that <laughs> What is that? <laughs> but apparently the owners say they're very reliable. So good for good for Buick. Good for you, Buick. You, you, you keep rocking it out there. You, you know, look, look there's... There's some things that we've certainly learned for doing this for the last 11 years when it comes to reliability, right? Uh, and one of the things we've learned is that people have a lot of built-in prejudices. I'm not going to mention a YouTube channel, but there's a YouTube channel that is basically, you know, built an empire based on kind of preaching to the choir, right? Mm -hmm. uh, justifying people's built-in prejudices against all cars. And you can see it in our comments, right? We do a video on a Stellantis product, and they're always like, oh, it's a Jeep, it's going to fall apart. Uh, and, and I think a lot of that is just not just only dead wrong, but like 180% wrong. So uh, let's talk about some of the vehicles that we've had long-term, right? And yep. we can t you know, and and and, and but these, are, is, these are these are vehicles that people say are horribly unreliable. Keep in mind, this is also anecdotal, right? This is just one vehicle, and it could be that we just got really lucky with them. Uh, that this is always a tricky part with reliability is um, what kills the brand is that one uncle that had one, yes, and that had all the yes. issues with it. But but we've had probably more cars than most people, 
and we've done more testing with them than most people. So I think we, we can speak not just anecdotally, but also from you know a pretty good subset of, of vehicles that we've had. Well, but we don't hold on to them for, at the most of the 40,000 miles. Right, and that's not really that long of a test but the, but to see. I, this is also based on, I think, the first three to, three months to one year of ownership. Okay, so, so this is initial reliability. Yeah, this isn't. Yeah, this is not like long term reliability either. So, you know, I think it's fair that we can, if Consumer Reports called us, we could certainly give them a professional. Uh, but let's talk about some of the vehicles that we've had, the people that would surprise people. Okay. All right. Um, so our TRX, which is the one that we've almost had a year now. Sure. Uh, I think we've got like 11,000 miles on it. Right. And those are hard 11,000, either towing or off-roading, right? How uh -huh. many issues have we had with it? Uh, that's been good. Zero. That's none. been really good, yep. None. Not one. Uh-huh. Not one. Not one issue we've had to actually take it in for. Yep. Uh, now, our Bronco has had issues. Uh, it's got two issues, right? And both are both remain unfixed. Right. Uh, to be fair. So the first issue was we got the uh, initial, obviously, launch edition, and it felt like there was a, a team of dwarves mining above our heads in that in that hard top. Right. In, in fact, it was so bad that we had to take it off uh, and put on a new hard top, a soft top, to fix the problem, and Ford has yet to provide us with a new hard top. Right. What was the other issue? The other issue is that you'll be driving along, and for no reason, it'll go full on uh, HVAC, either heat or air conditioning. It'll just turn on, and, and then there's no way to turn it off. Without, there's no way, the fan control stops working, you can't, like, down the fan, it's just full on. Whatever the temperature is, it'll go full on heat or full on cold, and the only way to actually stop it is to uh, turn off the HVAC system, to physically turn it off. The fan control stops working. Now, I hate to say it, though, the worst reliability issues I've had, second to worst reliability issues we've had, um, was with the new Jeep, though, was with the, the, the Rubicon 2 liter that almost left us stranded at the top of Mount Evans because the charging system stopped working for the uh, low voltage battery. Yes. That was pretty alarming. That was not a great situation. Yeah, and I, I think that also uh, points to something else that is kind of not just us, but whenever you buy a vehicle that has new technology, so that Jeep obviously had uh, not just uh, a new two liter turbo in it, right, but it also had that mild hybrid. Well, you could argue the same thing with the Bronco. This is the first open top four wheel drive they've done in 25 years. Right? I mean, it's, it's understandable that there's going to be Yeah, but be they issues. build convertibles, Tommy. Yeah, but not I mean, The Mustang convertible. Very different. Very different. It's not hard top removable panels, though. Well, how about the HVAC issue? Well, that, once again, I yeah. think that's related to the fact that it's a convertible with removable doors. But anyways, I think that it's fair to say that any new vehicle, be it new engines or, or all new platforms, can potentially have more issues than ones that are more sorted. Um, and like, for example, if, if a vehicle is eight years old, right, in the same product cycle, like that Grand Cherokee we just bought, um, we just bought a Grand Cherokee, a WK, I think that's a pretty good vet, pretty good vet for um, long-term reliability because all the issues that would have come across in the early models have probably been resolved yeah. eight years down the road. Yeah, you're, you're in some ways, you know, people say don't buy the first year of production. If you really want the most reliable one, I think get the last year of production. I agree. Okay, should we move on with the list? Yeah. Number four, coming in at 69 out of 100 is Infinity. They are up six spots from last year. Oh, congratulations, Infinity. Yeah, it's cool stuff. Great work. Um, Infinity does have some uh, nice luxury products that I think oftentimes go underappreciated in the uh, luxury car market. We just had the new QX model, the one based on the Pathfinder, and it was really good. Terrible naming structure, once again, but uh, surprisingly good vehicles. I think it's a QX60 is the one based on the Pathfinder, right? Yeah, uh, you know, I mean, it's telling that both Infinity and Nissan, of course, Infinity is Nissan's luxury brand, are on this list. Uh, so I, I suspect that has uh, something to do with the company and where they're trying to take their brand. Now, as we move on to number three, uh, 71 out of 100 points on the reliability rating. They are down one from last year, but still Toyota proving that, uh, in some cases, the legend is as true as reality. Yeah, I mean, Toyota certainly has, what do they call it, our reliability, RQB, RGB. <laughs> Roy G. Biv. What, what is that one? What, what's their, it's, it's their, it's their three-letter acronym for making things as reliable as possible. Uh, this is what, it, it's in their DNA. And unfortunately, I'm not a part of the Toyota organization. I, so. I don't remember the name. I know what yeah. you're talking about. It's, it's like, the rating system. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, they they, uh, they live, breathe, and uh, 
uh, live and die by their reliability. Uh, they're also one of the most conservative brands, so they will never or very rarely be the first to roll out any new tech. Of course, that is not true with their hybrid energy drive. They were the first to roll that out. But in general, uh, you, you know, they've held on to V8s the longest. They finally got rid of their V8 uh, in the Tundra. Uh, they also uh, are probably the least uh, quick to adopt uh, electrification. Right, they finally rolled out their first electrified vehicles. We're, we're in kind of a moment of time when electrification is becoming the thing, and yet Toyota has not jumped aboard, at least certainly not the way that many people think they should. Though they have been very aggressive with hydrogen. They've been very on top of the a hydrogen. A lot of the Asian brands have, yeah. yeah. That's a whole different conversation. Uh, but anyway, uh, and, and at, at the end of all that, when you're very conservative, when you're not the first to jump aboard something, but the last, when, when you... Um, make changes slowly when you keep your models around a long time, like the Tundra was around for a long time, uh, of course, uh, then you tend to have very strong reliability, and that's what Toyota has done. Very true, Dad. I think you're right. Now moving on to number one, uh, sorry, number two, jumping the gun a little bit, we've got Mazda, 75 out of a possible 100 points. They are down one from last year, but Mazda, of course, relatively small brand compared to Toyota and Honda, but still uh, very high volume here in the United States. They built some excellent vehicles. I would say also pretty conservative in terms of electrification and hybridization. I think they're conservative not because they want to be, but because they don't have the resources. Mm. It's very expensive. You know, I guess the Mazda's reputation in Japan is they're kind of the heartland brand, uh, the brand that has, you know, the most, like, traditional. And that would make sense with why they're so reliable. It's also a very unappreciated, I think, an underrated car company. Yeah, uh, I a, always, totally agree. A lot of the vehicles that they make uh, are exceptional, uh, best in class. Uh, I think the, the, the perfect example of that is the CX-5. I think that's that's one of the best mid-size crossovers out there. Mm. Mazda 6 was one of the best mid-size sedans, and it's one of those brands that automotive journalists love, but because they have such a limited dealer network here in America and because they have a limited budget in terms of marketing, I think they're, they're just overlooked, and it's a shame. Yeah, I think you're right. And, um, you know, they're not necessarily on top of the game in terms of having the quickest cars in class or the most efficient, but they certainly have some of the best design, excellent interiors, um, very high quality feeling vehicles when you're behind the wheel. Nice to drive as well. Once again, an engineering driven company, so you can really sense the engineering behind the vehicles when you drive them. Absolutely, yep. Now we'll see how they transition to electrification with vehicles like the MX30, uh, which which is you know I don't know. We'll see. We'll see well, how you, that. You that went turns and drove out. it. It was, a, once again, very nice car to drive, very nice car to look at, yeah, excellent but, interior, but excellent exterior. Not enough battery. But it only goes like 100 miles on a charge. Yeah. Um, and that brings us to the number one most reliable brand on the Consumer Reports list coming in. Drum roll, please. A score of 76 out of 100 points. No surprise. Up to, from last year, the Lexus brand. Yeah, I mean, it's telling that, that Lexus is number one and Toyota is number three. Sure. O once again, you know, it runs in the DNA of that company. Uh, and I think when you're looking at the luxury brand of Toyota, then they, they amp it up to 11 when it comes to reliability. So, um, yeah, no surprise. Uh, hard feat to pull off, probably much harder uh, than it seems. I think you have to have a culture that is immersed in, um, in that uh, sort of... Uh, reliability but yeah I'm I am super impressed uh, and congratulations to both Toyota and Lexus and all these brands that uh, made it to the most reliable uh, once again Tommy um, you know it's it's hard to build a reliable car nowadays because there's so much technology that goes into it. Sure, absolutely right. Now, um, as we start transitioning to some of the least reliable brands, there are some in the middle, which we're not talking about because of course we're only looking at the top 10 and the bottom 10, but uh, I think we mentioned them earlier, like brands like Porsche, um, they, they have 52 out of 100, Chevrolet, 48 out of 100, Ford, 44 out of 100, but um, when we look at the least reliable brands, we do have some some surprises, especially toward yeah, let's, the let, bottom. Let's talk about just this this um, this, this um, reliability, <laughs> reliability uh, and the way that Consumer Reports does it. They uh, surveyed a total of uh, 28 brands listed, um, and so the bottom 
and top end covered 19 through 28 and the bottom 41 through 60. So like I said, the middle brands. Yep, and 41 to 60 reliability rating is average out of 100 points. Okay. Um, so keep in mind, we're all ranking them out of out of 100. So let's talk about, why don't you talk about some of the highlights. Um, and there's some interesting things in here that I'm really surprised by. So let's talk about the highlights before we actually talk about the least reliable brands. <laughs> so the biggest slide by far was Ram, and that is down to one truck in the lineup, which is the Ram a classic. So what what Ram's doing is they build the, the brand new Ram. The Warlock, basically. Yeah, and then the old one, side by side, it just scored 11 points out of 100 on the reliability scale, which is pretty much off the charts. So that entire brand was let down by one truck. Which is uh, funny because I just said we had, had zero issues with the TRX, and yet here we are talking uh, about Ram. GMC was also let down by poor reliability ratings from the Sierra, 11 out of 100 points, and the Yukon, 2 out of 100 Wow. <laughs> That's pretty poor, Dad. Wow. Uh, the Grand Cherokee Wrangler and Gladiator all scored poorly on their reliability ratings with the Cherokee. Um, sorry, not Grand Cherokee. The Jeep Cherokee, the little one. Yep. Uh, the Cherokee scoring a 30, the Wrangler was 25, and the Gladiator was 23 out of 100. Um, what about Tesla? Uh, before we get to Tesla, you know, we kept the Gladiator for a year. You dro drove it. Do we have any issues with it? No, that was really good. Yeah. We actually lifted it. Uh, and put a Mopar lift on it, and did we have anything go wrong with it? Um, Think back. The wind, yeah, well, okay, I mean, what happened? there was some biggest design flaw with them, in my opinion, is the um, the defroster is really bad in the winter time. Oh, yeah, we did the, the video where the defroster didn't. Really bad didn't, at defrosting the windshields. Yeah. But that wasn't a reliability issue, that was more of a design issue. Yeah, and then I think that was it, it was pretty good. Uh, and then the, the Wranglers we've had have been pretty good. So my Wrangler, I just bought a Wrangler, has been really good. And then the white one, we did have that issue with the two-liter turbo. Yeah, the white one left us stranded. That was not a good thing. That was thing. not great. So if you look at Tesla, right, the Model 3 did decently well, scoring 59 out of 100. The Model S, the Model Y, and the Model X all scored under 20, though. And the X got just 5 out of 100 points. Yeah, the X got those... Uh, uh, Falcon wing doors, Tommy. A lot of moving parts in those. It's funny because for the most part, electric cars don't have a lot of moving parts, right? Most of the moving parts in a traditional car are in the engine. Uh, and since electric cars have electric motors, you don't have to worry about all that, right? They're sealed units. That if something goes wrong, you don't like fix a piston rod. You, you replace the whole motor. But keep in mind... Um Reliability is not just based on the engine, it's also based on the electronics, it's based on um, um, b body panels and that kind of thing. Yeah, our, our Model Y did leave us locked out of the back. <laughs> yep. The door would stop, the back, back driver's side door stopped uh, operating uh, so three times. I think Tesla really struggles with some of the electronic side of things and the, the fit and finish and quality build kind of things. So um, maybe that's why the X got 5 out of 100. And if you want to learn more, you can go on to Consumer Reports and... Um, you know, I, I think for the detailed information on these, you typically have to pay for them, don't you, to get all the really detailed... You have to be a member. Yeah. Um, or, but you can, or you can buy the magazine. The Aviator was the worst performing Lincoln, and with most of the brands, it's mainly only a few models or even just one that bring down the whole brand average. So it just goes to show that one lemon in the lineup can, can really leave the whole brand struggling on the ratings out of 100 points. All right, all right, shall we get to the bottom 10 then? Yeah, so number 19 out of 28, or number 10 on the least reliable yeah. brands. Maybe we'll go that way, yeah. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Yeah. So number 10 was the Kia, uh, reliability rating, four, sorry, 43, 43 4, 3 out of 100. They fell three positions from last year. Yeah, and I'm surprised because Kia and Hyundai have just been, uh, you know, knocking them out of the ballpark. And uh, I, I, in Kia's defense, I will say that both them and Hyundai uh, have really um, done, I think, a phenomenal job in completely refreshing their brands the most often and the most, period, in the shortest amount of time. So uh, it's incredible just how much change every model has compared to the last generation. Uh, and I think that also probably leads to reliability issues because you're making such drastic changes. These are not like Toyota way. These are not like subtle, small improvements. These are like, you know, one time the car is sporty and the next generation it's much more luxurious and then they go back to sportiness. It's crazy how much, how much, it, they're almost like different cars basically every generation. The other thing that's interesting is that the sister brand, um, Hyundai. Hyundai, is not on the least reliable and it's actually not on the most reliable either. So um, interesting there, although Genesis is on the top 10 least reliable. So 
Um, kind of an interesting thing there. You know what? Kia's best selling car is, right? The um, think, oh, Sportage. Think hamster. I think Hamster. Soul? Yeah. That, really? Yeah. Soul outsells the Sportage? I think so, yeah. Still? Yeah. yeah. Mm, that's yeah. interesting. And think about the latest model. It's completely different. It looks like a, it looks like a Martian uh, spacecraft landed. You know, the old one was kind of cute and fuzzy, you know, the Hamster one, and the new one is just much more, like, futuristic and techy. And, yeah, and that's their most popular brand, at least last, that's their most popular car last time I checked. So number nine on the list is Volvo, coming in at 42 out of 100 points. They are down one in position from 2020. Um, Volvo is a company that is owned by uh, the, the Chinese, right? Yeah. It's now technically a Chinese manufacturer. Well, they hate that when you say that because while they're, well, techni- while they're technically owned by, I think... Uh, most of the engineering comes out of Sweden. Yeah, is it's that all, what they it's, say? It, yeah everything is built and done in either Sweden or Belgium. I so am not... They, 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 I think they, they cringe when you say it's Chinese owned because we've certainly had calls from them when we've said that. So, Volvo, we understand while you may be owned by the Chinese, you are not a Chinese company. Okay. That, well... All right. <laughs> you have a hard time with that. It's just, it's like, it's like Mini is a German company now, right? I know they say they're a British company. Uh, but if, you're, if your parent is, is, is based in one, one country, I think that you kind of become that brand in a lot of ways. Well, I think that with Volvo, and I've, I've always been curious, they've also been pushing the tech in a lot of ways. Not, you know, Volvo, of course, has been known for safety, but like, you know, their recent powertrains have been these really high compression, supercharged, electrified uh, uh, or turbocharged, uh, or or both engines, and that's a there's a lot of tech. Right? When you when you both uh, electrify something and then you know either turbocharge it or supercharge it, or all three, or all three, that that's that's a lot of pressure you're putting on an internal combustion engine, right? Right. Uh, and I, I've always wondered about like the long term reliability of of, of that. Um, but that may not be the issue. That's just me kind of thinking out loud. The other thing, too, is like I didn't mean to – it wasn't a put-down saying that the parent company is Chinese because apparently some of the latest Chinese brands are just incredible. I'm really excited to see like X, Xpeng is one of them. Yeah, some of the Great new cars Wall. are supposed to just be like mind-blowing. I think Volvo was purchased by Gili. Yep, that's right. Yes. Okay, if we move on to number eight on the least reliable list, uh, Ram coming in at 40 out of 100. But as we mentioned, this down is... Down 12. That's one of the biggest downsides. I think it is the biggest yeah, slide yeah. on the list. It down could, 12 points compared to 2020. It could, it could be that, uh, the, the, the Warlock. The, it's Well, it's not just... The, the Warlock is just a trim on the Classic. Right, Keep yeah. that in mind. The Ram... 1500 Classic is the entire lineup. Uh, then that's the model that scored just 11 points out of 100. So uh, shame to see that, and I hope that they are able to improve for next year. You're squeaking over there. I know I'm squeaking. It's really bugging me. <laughs> it's really bugging me. I am, I am, for all of you who are not watching this on YouTube, I am switching stools except this one. Well, you're going to have to be a little shorter. <laughs> There we go. Oh, yeah. that was funny. Yeah, if that's better. Yeah, this one isn't squeaky. All right, that one was really squeaky. Yeah, it was so really bugging me. Ram, 40 points out of 100, uh, down 12 compared to 2020. Uh, and and that's just slightly ab- uh, above GMC coming in at number seven on the least reliable list. I, I, like I said, I've been listening to a lot of podcasts, you know? Yep. And I'm always amazed at like how many podcasts have technical issues, and I was always proud of the fact that we didn't, we really tried not to have them, and here I am sitting on a squeaky chair right I there. Know. You like listen to them, and dogs come in and start barking, yeah, and the mailman shows your up. Your chair is going to be squeaking. And uh, mics get unplugged, and people start drilling. It's, it's amazing like how much noise happens when you actually uh, you know, start recording. So, so GMC, 37 out of 100. Once again, Sierra, 11 out of 100. And the Yukon, 2. Do you think that's right, 2 out of 100? Uh, could be. I don't, know how, I don't know how big their sample size is. When I was listening to their podcast, uh, they said they call thousands of people, um, and they survey thousands of people. So it seems like it's a pretty big sample size. Two out of 100. But if you call, you'd probably have to call like tens of thousands, right? Because how many people own Yukons? Uh, a lot of a people lot. own Yukons, yeah. and I think that the, um, the, a lot. the I bet you're right. It's a very popular vehicle. I think that the whole survey is 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 probably hundreds of thousands if you combine all the vehicles. Um, I'd be surprised if it was if it was smaller than that. Yeah, I'm sure it's a lot of. I gotta get that exact number. Yeah, uh, but 37 out of 100 for GMC. They are down five compared to 2020, um, and that's number seven in the least reliable list. Number six. This is that example of where luxury may not equal reliability. Mm. Mercedes-Benz coming in at 34 out of a possible 100 points, and they are down two. I would I would put that up to um, the complexity of what Mercedes is doing nowadays. I think their infotainment is 
MBUX is one of the more complicated ones out there. They're really pushing the envelope in terms of both tech uh, and like what is possible, and I think that ends up hurting you in reliability. It's the exact opposite of Toyota, right? Right, they are really pushing the envelope. You just drove the. Um, uh, the S, the new EQS, that thing EQS. was amazing. Yeah, so what an incredible vehicle! It's got this hyper screen that's bigger than this table we're sitting 50, in front of. Fifty-four inches of screen in it. Yeah. I know. It was. I mean, I really do like the the newest Mercedes products. They're just incredible to drive. Fifth, and when you have a fifty-four inch screen that basically turns into like there's three sections of it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, think about like the potential for things to go wrong, both from like a user interface and or uh, just the, the tech behind all that, right? Yes. Yeah, I, I think you're pretty spot on there, Dad. And they are, and they are really pushing it. And, and it's not just in their electric vehicles. It's also in their, uh, in their traditional combustion engine vehicles. They're, they're putting out huge amounts of horsepower in their AMGs. You know, these are very sophisticated, um, complex, complex, highly sport, over-engineered like, sports cars, and that might be one of the reasons. Once again, I'm guessing here. I'm sure, um, you know, there might be other reasons, but I think it's an educated guess. Uh, but keep in mind too, at one point, like in the '70s and '80s, Mercedes used to build bank vaults with no technology in them, right? Like that 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 Mercedes 82 I had, the, the diesel didn't even need electricity to run. It was all. <laughs> yeah. so, I mean, you could disconnect the battery had, and the alternator. They and had to have running. like an off switch, basically. On, yeah, fuel and, shut and off. Engine. Yeah, to, to turn it off because it would run through yeah, everything. Yeah, that, that's how dedicated to running these engines were. So <laughs> very different. Mercedes now is certainly cutting edge, bleeding edge of technology. Where back in the 80s and 90s and, and, and that era, they were certainly trailing edge technology, but dirt reliable. And actually, I'm flying out tomorrow to go drive the new SL. I'm it, really looking forward to that. It's been said, though, that it's hard to make money as a brand as like Mercedes in the 70s and 80s because they just never broke. I mean, there was no reason to replace your 123 Mercedes. They never changed the body style. The new ones looked like the old ones, and they just wouldn't die. It's hard to make that a profitable business. So number five on the list, the only car on our least reliable list that has actually improved, or the only brand, excuse me, is Volkswagen. They came in with 31 out of 100 possible points, and they are up one compared to last year. Yeah, I don't know what to say about that. Uh, Volkswagen does have a bunch of new models out. Um, could be part of that, right? Uh, they are changing their lineup quite significantly, and whenever you have a lot of new models, and I'm talking about, I'm curious, there's a new GTI, there's a new GLI, there's a new Golf R, ID4. there's a new ID4, there's a new Taos. Tiguan. Uh, Tiguan. Um, you know, like I say, it's always better to buy the last year of a model than the very first year, uh, and that, that would be my guess at it. Um, you know, Volkswagen is a brand, a storied brand in America, and they've... Uh, they certainly had their ups and downs, um, and uh, right now they're kind of, I think, in a transition, trying to certainly go from internal combustion to electrification. Uh, and they're one of the car companies that's pushing that with the ID4. And there's, you know, in America we get the ID4, but in Europe there's a lot more electrified Mercedes, like the ID3, mm -hmm. which we don't get. Uh, I think there's an ID5 coming, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, it, you know, whenever you, when you're ever in the middle of this kind of seismic change, I think reliability tends to suffer. So number four on the list, coming into 30 out of 100. Big surprise for me, this is a new brand on the list, but Genesis, only 31 out of 100 on the reliability rating score. Yeah, I don't know. That's, that's weird. I always felt like Genesis was up there with, uh, it was like it was like the, the, the smart man's Lexus, right? If you got Lexus quality, apparently not reliability uh, for, let's say, you know, two-thirds of the price. Yeah, I really like what Genesis is doing. I think they have some really nice designs. They've got some beautiful interiors. They've got some high-performing engines as well. So it's disappointing to see them this low on the reliability rating, at least on this Consumer it, Report it, survey. And it is. It, I mean, Genesis has been around a while, but it is its new standalone brand. So that may have something to do with it, right? They're trying to build out Genesis dealerships. Uh, and so it may be teething pains. Yeah, could uh, be. Could be. Uh, certainly, they're pushing the envelope in terms of design and in terms of uh, some of their newest vehicles, right? Some, the, 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 the Genesis that we're seeing are just spectacular in terms of like their um, styling. So that could have a lot to do with it. Hard, hard to say, but yeah, I'm kind of surprised. Okay, number three on the least reliable okay, list. the top three. Top oh, three. Bottom three, actually. Bottom three. Say no, Tommy. Tell me no. 26 out of 100. Oh, people are going to hate this. They're going to hate... They're going to hate... Two of the two or three of these down five yes. uh, from their position in 2020. Number three, Jeep. Ouch. Dun dun dun. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's certainly a brand that we've you know have a lot of experience with. Oh yes, because we love love. People think we're Jeep fanboys, and I guess to some extent we are. I'll give them that. But it's also because we live in Colorado, uh, and Jeeps are in the DNA here, right? So we do a lot of off-roading. We do a lot of uh, 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 just a lot of you know dirt roads, no driving Jeeps. Just naturally go with Colorado, uh, and so I'm sad to see this 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 brand be down here. I think it might have to do. I'm once again guessing, but it might have to do with the fact that they're also kind of in the process of rolling out a lot of new models. Yes, tons of new models. I also, um, it's interesting that the Wrangler only scored 23 out of 100 because, sorry, 25 out of 100. Um, I talked to a lot of people on trails that, that recognize us from the channel. Yeah. And uh, pretty much everyone I talked to with the newer JL say, actually everybody I've talked to, and it must be a few dozen, say they love their uh, Wrangler JLs and have had no issues with them. I actually haven't any talked to anyone that said a horror story, but that could be because they're enthusiasts and they're out on the trails. Um, but yeah, I mean, Jeep is, of course, much more than just the Wrangler. They are, are a really big brand. They've got the Renegades, uh, the Compasses of the world, the Cherokees of the world. So uh, you can't just judge it based on one model. Well, here's the thing, okay? So Jeep has got some branding issues right now because it's, it's, it's a tale of two, two Jeeps, really, right? There's like two brands in one now. Jeep used to be kind of a solid off-road, you know, Wranglers were affordable, and this was just a an every man, every woman kind of brand. And now they've kind of transitioned from that into trying to become luxury. And I'm talking about, of course, the Wagoneer and the Grand Wagoneer, to some extent the Grand Cherokee L. And let's face it, a Rubicon um, Wrangler 4xE is a $60,000 vehicle, so is a Gladiator. So we're getting into some, you know, pretty lofty airspace. Uh, and, um, you know, it might be a teething problem, you know, trying to take a brand that has been traditionally more mainstream and making it more luxury oriented. And I, I don't know, I don't know if they'll succeed. I, I really worry about it. I don't know how how you like sell a Grand Wagoneer, which can sticker over 100000 in the same dealership, this is the Genesis problem that you're selling a Renegade, right, uh, or a Patriot. Well, this is the old Genesis problem because, right, right when it was Hyundai Genesis yeah. and Hyundai Equus, you would buy an Equus that was 80 grand next to the Landra, which was 15. And Jeep's solution to this uh, seems to have been to take the Jeep brand off of the Grand Wagoneer and the Wagoneer. But that's still you're still going to a Jeep well, dealer to get it fixed and to buy the thing. And, and what I mean, take it out there doesn't say Jeep anywhere on. Sure, or, right? They removed the branding. Yeah, you know, I don't think that's a good solution. I don't think that's also a good solution. So, you know, this has kind of become a, a much broader conversation than about reliability. But yeah, this is Jeep is in transition, and we'll see where it ends up. It'll be interesting. So number two ranked um, uh, 25 out of 100. Oh, we're going to get a lot of hate for this. Sorry, scoring 25 out of 100 on the reliability rating. No change from 2020 is Tesla. So they are the second least reliable brand, according to the survey. Yeah, and uh, we've had three Teslas. Yep. Uh, and they... First of all, the the thing we figured out, maybe this has changed since we've added what we, uh, I hate to say this, had a a little bit of a a fender bender with the Model 3 we own. I had a fender bender. Yes, I I, I hate to bring that up. Yep. Sorry. And it took... uh, it took a long time to get it fixed. But that wasn't the, the car's fault that it crashed into no. a garage. It was my fault. No, but but it, it was the, 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 the fixing part was, it was horrible. Very, was it was very painful. Yeah. Although that was still a fairly new car in the lineup back then. And I wonder if it would be better today. Um, because I think that was two years ago, three years ago. Yeah. And it was still pretty fresh in the lineup. So maybe they've improved that in, in 2021. And then we moved on uh, to the Model X, which which was also kind of, you know, spot... Hit hit and miss on its on its like those Falcon wing doors. Uh, I, I, every time I opened them, I was just waiting for something to fail. They're they're so complicated and there's so much well, they so would, many sensors in those things. They would incredible. often open even even if you were in a, a place where they sh- they should be able to open a lot. They would only open a few inches, which was always frustrating. The Model X was pretty good reliability wise. Oh, it was not no, though because no. the uh, the CV joints, joints yeah, started so, failing at like two thousand miles. Yeah, we got that shutter. So what happens? Because it's got so much power, right, going through uh, the CV joints, in order to get full acceleration, you have to. Li- well, why don't you explain it? You're better at this than I am. Well, uh, basically, if the if the car is in its normal height and you you floor it enough times, um, the angles are wrong and the, the CVs. The, the, the drive sp- shafts are, are are not straight. They're not lined up they're not, with. They're not parallel to the road. Road, and so they're like this. The angles so are too steep. You're putting at you're putting too much pressure on the CV joint. Yeah, so they they tend to to shudder and then eventually fail after time. 
Um, and Tesla solution is to basically derate the car a little bit unless you're in this low suspension height, in which case the CV angle is better. But even at like, I don't know, 5,000 miles, our car started shuddering pretty badly in hard acceleration, which was not a good thing in a brand new car that cost 85 grand and is known for its acceleration. The other problem with the Model X was, and I think this is Model S too, was the early models had, so Tesla it was known for using like consumer, like consumer um, rated screens in their vehicles. Uh, and I had a long conversation with a Ford guy once about like how, why you know is it so expensive to put a screen in a car? And he said, well, because we can't use consumer rated screens, we have to use automotive screens, which are rated for you know cold weather and hot weather and much more much more reliability. Because when you think about it, if your TV goes out, you just go and buy another TV, right? right. It's not expensive. Sure. If the screen in your car goes out, you're not only stranded in the car because especially in a Tesla, you're not going anywhere without that screen. Because well, you're not controlling anything. Uh, yeah, you won't know your speed limit. Everything. You won't be able to control your HVAC. You won't be able to, you know, change any any critical functions of the car. You'll probably still be able to drive it. But the Model S and the Model uh, X had the issue where those screens would start to yellow and fail eventually. Ours did not, though. Ours was good. Ours may have been new enough where they actually got a better. And then the Model Y, we did have two door handle failures and then a sticky hatch, which was never resolved. And then we had the issue with the That's heat pump. That's a really pump. common problem in the Model Y. Remember the heat pump failed, too, on top of Mount Evans? That yeah. was not great. Yeah, so you were coming home. Or Loveland Pass. You were coming was like home, Loveland Pass, in the middle of winter. And, and 10 degrees outside, and the, the heater wouldn't work. Yeah, so they put a heat pump in there, which gives you better efficiency. But one of the controls was a known issue where it would stop basically working. And, and then the rear hatch would get stuck on itself when it would open. It was so misaligned. and We got it realigned. It would still get stuck. It was not a beacon of reliability the model y we had that's true yeah it it, it never felt like you know like, like i said like that mini at the beginning of this uh, podcast slash video felt like it's like a mercedes what i meant by that it felt like it feels like it's made out of one piece of granite uh the model y3 and x never felt that way they always felt like the sum of their parts that's right. Yep. Okay, should we move on to number one? A number one brand. This is very surprising. The least reliable brand on the list. According to Consumer Reports, of course. No change from last year. Reliability rating of 18 out of 100 points is Lincoln. And I don't have anything to say to that. I don't either. I don't really we, understand we have very, why that very, is. We, have, we don't understand why that is. We have very uh, limited experience with Lincoln, obviously. You know, Lincoln has a few cars. They're kind of like Cadillac, right? They're in that same position where they're trying to reinvent American luxury. I drove the um, uh, Aviator on the press launch. That yeah. was amazing. They really did a nice job on the Aviator. But here in Colorado, you will never... You, I bet you you could drive around all day today and not see one Lincoln. Saw a lot of them in Florida. Yes. I just was in Florida this weekend. Saw a bunch of them. Saw a bunch of Aviators, which is the uh, even the plug-in hybrid one. Yeah. Very cool car, but apparently... Judging off of this list, the Aviator was the worst performing Lincoln um, in in terms of its its score. And Lincoln as a brand came out 18 out of 100, so not not fantastic. Why do you think that is? I like it, just a lot of tech in them. I think there's a lot of well, the Aviator technology. certainly. But you know, let's face it. I mean, Cadillac has one model that just sells outsells everything, and that of course is the Escalade. And uh, Lincoln has the same kind of deal where it's a Navigator, right? And now the Aviator. I think Aviator's selling pretty well. And then so, they've yeah. got the little one, the Corsair, which I think is probably selling pretty well as well. Um, but the sedan, I don't even, I mean, I don't, can't remember the last time I saw a new Lincoln sedan. Well, it's funny, like, you know, in the top most reliable brands, you've got Toyota and Lexus together yep. at the top. But here, Ford is in the middle and Lincoln is at the bottom. Yeah, very interesting. Which is very interesting because you would think that the two brands, you know, considering a lot of these cars are built by the same people, engineered by the same people, you know, have the same DNA in them, basically. You, you would think that the two would correlate. So there's something happening with Lincoln. And, and, and this, you know, once again, they ask owners. The other thing that... that uh, what about what about this? It's going to be the owners and not yes. the cars. Yes, I'm wondering if that the Lincoln owners in yeah. more advanced age, such as yourself... Thank you, Tommy. Um, I appreciate that. <laughs> and being an older gentleman... Oh, I can't open the door and get my walker in. No, I mean more like oh. maybe maybe the older demographic are more picky about reliability problems. You know where a younger person may ignore a squeak or two. The Every time I go to Walgreens to get my that's right to get my Geritol third, third prescription of the day, <laughs> the door squeaks when I open it. It's true though, actually. I've got that old Grand Cherokee that squeaks and rattles like a basket. Oh, of it does. Bags, yes, that's true. And it drives you up the wall, and I don't even pay attention to it. I you just, mean that like, horrible squeak in the back where it sounds like somebody <laughs> it's, it's somebody my point exactly two styrofoam <laughs> containers and just molesting them, where it's like my point exactly. And yes. you, don't, you don't notice that. 
Why? I mean, that one's especially annoying. But like my mini, my mini, my old mini rattles and, and bangs yes. like hell. Yeah. And you're always like poking stuff and trying to fix it. And that's just part of the experience. I think, I think you think that's because I'm older than you or you think that's just because no, that's the kind of person I am? you're older and I think older folks are more picky. And, no, and no. Yes, I, I think that's true. Dude, when I was your age and I had a squeak in, in my car, it would drive me up the wall. Like, for up example, the wall. our videographer Alex, his yeah. brake controller on his truck broke like... Six months ago, he hasn't gotten it fixed. I think that's that's a personality thing. Like I, if something breaks, I need to. There's just I, I'm like OCD. I need to fix it. Well, there it. was nothing to do uh, in the and 1980s. I, and it just it just bugs me every time I get in the but vehicle. But when you were my age in 1987, there was nothing oh. to do. There was no internet. There was no Instagram. I still had all. To. All you had to do was focus on fixing squeaks and rattles. That's all there was to do in the 1980s. <laughs> I had uh, junior achievement. I went to nowadays. Yeah, nowadays <laughs> we have better stuff to do with our time than to fix panel gaps and like, squeaks. Like, Rattles. What's that? What, stare into your phone? That's right. That's <laughs> what we're doing. That? That's what the youths are doing nowadays. Is that what? Is that the only thing that you have to do? It's important stuff to do. Got a lot, a lot, of, a lot of staring to do, a lot of liking, no, a lot of scrolling. No, I, I, yeah, a, lot, a, lot, a lot of trolling. Yeah, in the 1980s. What else were you going to do? Uh, I'm just Make say- your hair weird, put in shoulder pads, and fix rattles. Uh, I'm just saying, Tommy, I, I'm even, you know, at, at like a tender age of... 16 when I started driving, a squeak would have drove me up the wall. It just would have. Because the radio was so bad in, in the, your CBCC, <laughs> your Honda Civic. <laughs> One speaker blaring AM radio out of the middle of the dash. Oh, yes. This is true. The radios were pretty Pretty pathet- bad. They exactly. Were, they were pretty pathetic. Maybe that is it. Maybe us use listen to music loud. I was with my grandma. Well, yeah. And she listens to it very loud because no, her ears to, don't work. <laughs> she listens to it so incredibly softly, actually. Really? I was listening to the well, song. I well, could barely hear well, it. She that, was like, that's you certainly need to the turn other that ca- down. That's certainly the other case when, when, you, when the news is on at her house. It's true. It's you, so loud, I can't even talk to her on the phone. Well, that's because my grandpa can't hear. But you, <laughs> you listen to music quietly. I listen to music more loudly. It depends on it the music. It covers up the squeaks it, and the rattles. It depends on the music. Yeah, I've never heard you listen to Diplo. In, in any kind of extended like, volume I, I, there, Dad. I like, I'm into chill right now, and chill is not the kind of music you blare. It You've isn't. been into chill for the last 10 years. It yeah, hasn't changed. Yeah, yeah. There you have it. Yeah, well, you know, it, I think when you, when you grew up with uh, Top 10 Radio, you got so sick of hearing the, you know, the same Journey song played 50,000 times a day that it's fresh to be able to go and Exactly. Act. You would turn off Don't Stop Believing, and then you could hear all the had, rattles, and, and then, then you, you went the to problem fix with. Then you have this problem with, let's say you got some song that you're really grooving with, right? Yep. Like, you know, I'm a big Pink Floyd guy. I love listening to that. Comfortably numb. I'll, I'll, I'll just, you know, blast it, right? Uh-huh. But you're blasting it, and then the stupid-ass commercial comes on, and then you got more commercials and songs, right? Because that's the way it used to be. Yep. And then you always have to keep messing with it. And then here's another thing, by the way. Uh, why doesn't that, like, um, system in the radio where it increases the volume as the noise increases as you go faster. Why does that never work? And now we see, ladies and gentlemen, why the older demographic is more anal about changing no, and fixing squeaks and rattles. Why does that never work? I, I you know don't what I'm know. talking about? I like the speed sensitive. It's been around since like a thousand years ago. And it doesn't work. It works great. It doesn't work. It always works. It doesn't work. It always it, works. No, it either makes it too loud or too soft. All right. And then you're, what happens is, let me know in the comments if this is true. So you've got this thing on, and you don't know it's on. And then you'll speed up, and the noise gets louder, and the radio gets louder. And then you'll, like, you'll be like, why is this radio getting louder? So you turn the radio down, and then the system tries to compensate by turning it up. And then you, next thing you know, you're fighting with your radio. We now see why the advanced age attitude is put Lincoln in the bottom position. <laughs> All right, guys, let us know. Although Lexus also has an older demographic, and they're number one. <laughs> That's so right. I don't, know, I don't know what the equation is there. And, and Honda has an older demographic, and they're most reliable. That's true. I'm, I'm, I, look, the point that we're making here is maybe it has to do with the people they're asking. Yes, that's, that's true. More than the vehicle itself. Well, let us know what you think in the comment section below. Yep, and as always, check out tfl-studios.com where we get all of our content up there. We got our podcasts. We got our... YouTubes. And we got our... Internet. All of it. <laughs> All our websites. We'll see you guys <laughs> next, next time. time. Ciao.